Hello again, and thank you for watching. Today I wanted to talk directly to people who are uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, that are active Jehovah's Witnesses, and specifically, uh, if you are or if you know somebody who was a born-in Jehovah's Witness, that is to say, somebody who uh, grew up with the Jehovah's Witness religion being the only faith that you knew, perhaps your parents were Jehovah's Witnesses or still are, uh, perhaps older generations of your family, grandparents, great-grandparents, as the case might be. Specifically, if you or somebody you know is a uh, is an active Jehovah's Witness that was born in, and you're younger than the age of, let's say, about 35. In this video, I wanted to speak directly to you and recommend that you consider this. I mean this very respectfully. I know that when you are a born-in uh, Jehovah's Witness, everything that comes from the uh, platform at a Kingdom Hall, everything that comes from the stage at a uh, a convention or assembly or a special assembly day, and particularly things that come to you and are presented to you from the publications, uh, carry a certain amount of uh, uh, gravity and, and weight. Um, a born in Jehovah's Witness is often um, uh, brought up or, or, or instructed to consider that the message that comes from the publications is of some sort of divine origin. Now, whether that's considered inspired or, you know, quote unquote, the Word of God, um, the information that's contained in uh, in the publications is something that uh, we would all do well to uh, to take to heart. Now, perhaps you're familiar with um, the most recent publications, but maybe you're familiar, maybe you're not familiar with some of the older publications. And I don't mean something from the ancient mists of time, from the days of uh, C.T. Russell, uh, or even the uh, the writings of uh, of J.F. Rutherford. Uh, but something that was within your lifetime, but maybe something that you haven't considered at the uh, at the meetings. Maybe something that part of when there still was a a book study arrangement. Maybe there was a book that you didn't consider um, at the Kingdom Hall or in the the book study when that was still the arrangement. But yet something that was still fairly current and within your lifetime. So with that being said, I would like to bring your attention to something that's uh, on the uh, uh, Watchtower online at uh, jw.org and I'd like to respectfully submit it for your consideration now. Let's begin our search by going to the Watchtower online library, wll.jw.org. If we put in a search for the best book, and when we begin our search, it gives us a lot of results. Let's narrow it down a little bit by unchecking all the different categories and only checking where it says the Awake magazine. And that narrows down our search Let's go to the third one down here, the best book on world's religions, which as you can see is fairly recent, comes from the Awake magazine of 2009. And in this article, it says that a high school teacher in Canada um, saw a challenge in being able to teach her students about uh, different religions in her area. So she read the book, Mankind's Search for God, and exclaimed, this is the best book describing the world's religions that she's ever read. She asked for permission from the school board to use this book in class. And so she contacted her local branch and asked for 40 copies. And of course, the witnesses were more than happy to get those uh, copies to her. After using this in class, some of her students um, wanted to get a copy of the book for themselves. So I guess this was an article, but apparently it's a little bit more of an ad because it says you may also find that it could help you understand the religions of the people in your community um, based on the origins and teachings, etc. So if you as a reader of the Awake magazine would like to take advantage of this, you can fill out this coupon. But why do that? We're already on the publications webpage. So we're going to select publications and go here to books. And let's just find Mankind's Search for God. So we'll scroll down here. Looks like it's alphabetical. Mankind's, Mankind's Search for God. I don't see anything called Mankind's Search for God. Well, maybe it's just Search for God. So let's go down here. Nothing under search for God either. So this goes all the way back to, looks like 2001, and there's no mankind search for God. So the best book on world's religions doesn't appear to be on their website. That's okay, I have my own uh, copy that we can refer to. So this is what the cover of the book looked like back in the day when it first came out, Mankind Search for God inside cover pages and there's an invitation here it says during the thousands of years of mankind's history man's search for god has led down many pathways 
The result has been the enormous uh, diversity of religious expression found worldwide, from the endless variety of Hinduism to the monotheism of Judaism, Islam, and Christendom, and to the oriental philosophies of Shinto, Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. In other vast regions, mankind has turned to animism, magic, spiritism, and shamanism. Has this search for God been successful? Through this book, we invite you, regardless of your religious background, to join in this fascinating search for the true God. So the publishers of this uh, book are asking us to join in this fascinating search. So as you can see, that uh, this book was first published in uh, 1990 by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And it's interesting, um, some of the, uh, the bibliography here, unlike many bibliographies that you would read, where it indicates the specific pages and uh, quotes, um, you'll notice that there's a variety of different sources that the publishers used when they put this together. So for an example, among others, the bibliography includes the Encyclopedia of Eastern Philosophy and Religion, uh, Hindu mythology, mythology and in, an illustrated encyclopedia, the philosophy of Confucius, uh, sources of modern atheism, South American mythology, symbolism of Hindu gods and rituals, the wisdom of Confucius, and many, many others. It's also interesting to me that this is one of the rare books that you'll come across or encounter from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society that actually quotes passages from the Quran. You're not going to see that too often. So we have our table of contents and the initial chapter is why be interested in other religions. And I thought that that was a very uh, interesting point to make. And specifically when you get to paragraph 11 of the first chapter, it says, to answer that we need to know something about the background of the world religions. As Jeffrey Perinder states in World Religions from Ancient History to the Present, to study different religions need not imply infidelity to one's own faith. How interesting is that? To study different religions does not imply that you're being unfaithful to your faith. But rather, it may be enlarged. So your faith can be enlarged by seeing how other people have sought for reality and have been enriched by their search. So that is the end of the quote from this Jeffrey Perinder. And then it says, knowledge leads to understanding. And understanding to tolerance of people with a different viewpoint. So how interesting that this quote says that when you are considering or studying other religions, it is not a reflection of infidelity, but rather it's to get additional knowledge. Knowledge, understanding, and tolerance. Now, in the next paragraph under Why Investigate, have you ever thought or said, I have my own religion? No doubt, if you're a witness, you've heard many people at the doorstep say that to you. It is a very personal matter. I do not discuss it with others. And the book continues on paragraph 12, true religion is very personal. Virtually from birth, religious or ethical ideas are implanted in our mind by our parents and relatives. If that is true for the people that whose doors you're knocking upon, is it possible that that might also be true with you as a born-in witness? Returning to the paragraph, it says, as a consequence, we usually follow the religious ideals of our parents and grandparents. Religion has become almost a matter of family tradition. What is the result? It says that in many cases, others have chosen our religion for us. It has simply been a matter of where we were born and when. Or as historian Arnold Toynbee indicated, an individual's adherence to a certain faith is often described, or determined, I should say, by the geographical accident of the locality of his birthplace. So it's a very interesting concept that's being brought out here in the publication, chapter 1, paragraph 12, that many people that a witness would encounter at the door simply have the faith of their family. Again, I put to you, if that's true with people that you would meet at the door, is not that possibly the same thing with you as a born in Jehovah's Witness. So when we continue on on paragraph 13, it says, is it possible to assume that the religion imposed at one's birth is necessarily the whole truth? And it goes on to say, if you were born in certain areas of the world, you were likely raised a Catholic, or in other areas of the world, likely an Indi uh, Hindu rather, or Sikh, or Muslim as the case might be. 
Then as we get to paragraph 14 of the first chapter, it says, Therefore, is the religion of one's birth automatically the true one approved by God? That's a fascinating question, isn't it? Paragraph 15 says, With the wide diversity of religious expression that has developed around the world for the past 6,000 years, it is at least educational and mind-broadening to understand what others believe and how their beliefs originated. And it might also open up vistas of a more concrete hope for your future. So we're seeing a theme already here in the first chapter of this book that indicates that it's mind-broadening to be able to understand what other people believe and where those beliefs originated. So it's very easy for a witness to apply that outwardly to somebody that they might encounter in their ministry, whether it's on the doorstep or at a public witnessing cart. But as a born-in witness, have you ever asked yourself that question? So as we continue along with um, the rest of this first chapter, you'll notice here, as I I was mentioning, that this is one of those rare situations where you see that uh, the Watchtower has actually quoted passages from other holy books notably uh, the Quran here, as we have, uh, as we have in, this, in this paragraph. And then we consider on in, um, let's see here, uh, paragraph, let's see, how should, uh, paragraph 19, how should religion be uh, measured? And uh, each person's conduct will normally be a reflection to a greater or lesser degree of their religious background. What effect does your religion have on you? Does your religion produce a kinder person, a more generous, generous, excuse me, honest, humble, tolerant, and compassionate person? And then it quotes the passage from Jesus indicating that it's by the fruitage of one's faith that, uh, um, that you'll be able to judge. So as we continue on, I wanted to also bring out something that was brought out in paragraph 27 of the first chapter. And it says that the oldest portions of the Bible predates all of the world's other religious writings. So the first five books of the Bible are attributed within this publication to be in the 15th and 16th centuries BCE. Uh, The Rig Veda was completed about 900 BCE, so it indicates that it's not quite as old. Um, Let's see, the Buddhist canon of the three baskets goes back only to the 5th century BCE and the Quran. Um, it was transmitted through the angel Gabriel, uh, according to the claim, and that was in the 7th century CE, and on and on. So it says here in paragraph 27, If some of these works are divinely inspired, as some assert, then what they offer in terms of religious guidance should not contradict the teachings of the Bible, which is the original inspired source. So based on what we're seeing here, because the Bible is written and it is the oldest of the holy writings that are listed in this paragraph. Therefore, everything should be able to be coincided with what it says uh, in the Bible. Again, very, uh, very intriguing position that's put forth there. Now we get into the next chapter, which is, how did it begin? Now, I'm obviously not going to go over the whole book, but already I wanted to, to just, in the interest of intellectual honesty, If there was ever a time that the witnesses were presenting this publication door-to-door in the ministry, and based on the publication date of 1990, you would would imagine that there was at least a a brief period of time where this was offered in the house-to-house ministry. If the witness that was carrying this publication in their bag is asking a member of the public to consider the origins of their faith, so as we get into chapter 2, the question of origin comes up. It says there, in almost every religion, we can find a central figure to whom credit is given for establishing the true faith. So therefore, if you take a look at the individuals that were involved at the beginning or at the origin of a certain faith, it can be very, very telling. So if you were a witness asking members of the public to consider that about their own faith, have you, as a born-in Jehovah's Witness member, done the same type of research personally. It says here, many of those referring to the central figures of the faith, many of them have left behind writings or sayings that form the basis of a new religion. 
In time, what they said and did was elaborated, embellished, and given a mystic aura, and some of these leaders were even deified. Paragraph 5 continues that even those individuals um, that are considered founders of their major religions that we know of, it must be noted that they did not actually originate the religion. In most cases, their teachings grew out of existing religious ideas, even though most of these founders claim divine inspiration as their source, or they changed and modified existing religious systems that had become unsatisfactory in one way or the other. So again, it's interesting. If a, if a witness has been asking members of the public to take a look at the writings of the folks that have uh, originated the, the faith, whatever uh, church that they ascribe to, have you done the same thing? Have you taken a look at the, the writings of the folks that have originated the faith that, that you have? Now, I know that a Jehovah's Witness will indicate that the originator of uh, their faith is, is Jesus. However, in the modern era, those that first started um, uh, the, the, the faith that is now known as Jehovah's Witnesses, that started in 1931, with J.F. Rutherford. Prior to that time, the Jehovah's Witnesses were known as international Bible students. Well, what were the writings of those folks that uh, were in the early stages of the faith that, that you ascribe to? The questions of origin, what a wonderful place to start. And so then again, I would respectfully ask of a born-in witness to ask the same question of their own faith. It's interesting, we had talked um, earlier on about the fact that the Bible is, uh, is an ancient book, and therefore, because it's old, we should uh, trust it. And in the same chapter, in paragraph uh, 37 of that same second chapter, there's an indication here of a, something that you might not be familiar with. So let me get the... It says, ancient Chinese legends also tell of a golden age of something called the Yellow Emperor, who is said to have ruled for a hundred years in the 26th century BCE. So here we have something that is uh, even older than um, when the, the Bible was, was uh, supposedly written. And you'll notice here that it says in this paragraph that this Yellow Emperor was credited with inventing everything having to do with their civilization, clothing and shelter, vehicles of transportation, weapons and warfare, land management, manufacturing, silk, uh, silk culture rather, music, language, mathematics, the calendar, and so on. During his reign, it is said, that there were no thieves or fights in China. People lived in humility and peace. Timely rain and weather resulted in abundant harvest year after year. Most amazing was that even the wild beasts did not kill, and birds of prey did no harm. In short, the history of China began with a paradise, and to this day the Chinese still claim to be the descendants of the Yellow Emperor. So it's interesting in this book that it goes into um, it goes into resources that are are not just um, watchtower publications. We mentioned earlier in the bibliography of this book that there are all, all kinds of um, sources that are searched. So if we are following the lead of the organization, the organization did a significant, significant amount of research. As a matter of fact, there's over 25 pages in this book and a chapter that's devoted to, uh, to, to magic in spiritism. So it's very interesting that here we see an example of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society going to uh, going to third party sources to come up with this uh, to come up with this this resource. So, have we, if we're practicing intellectual honesty, have we as an individual witness gone through and studied the same the same type of things? Very very interesting in paragraph thirty eight this chapter. It's talking about the fact that there are legendary accounts of a time of happiness and perfection, like with this yellow emperor. It says, was it just by accident that all these people who lived far from each other and who had totally different cultures, languages, and customs entertained the same ideas about their origin? Was it just by chance or coincidence that all of them chose to explain their beginnings in the same way? Please note here, this is the second chapter of this book, and we're on paragraph 38, and it says, logic and experience tell us that this could hardly be so. On the contrary, 
interwoven in all of these legends, there must be some common elements of truth about the beginning of man and his religion. So logic and experience tell us that if legends the world over from a variety of different cultures all have this claim to there being perfection at the beginning or in their origin, does that also hold true with other teachings? And what I mean by that specifically is, what about teachings of the immortality of the soul, or the Trinity, or a variety of other teachings? If we're being intellectually honest, isn't it true that across a variety of cultures, across multiple timelines of human history, therefore there were some common elements having to deal with a variety of teachings, not just where man started, but a variety of other common teachings, does that also mean that there's a nugget of truth to those teachings as well? It's interesting to ask that as, a, as an intellectual question. And so, therefore, I'm not going to go into any more of this book, but if you haven't heard of, of this book, it's something that's, that's worth taking a look at. So hopefully this information was, was useful. And again, please understand, I'm submitting this very respectfully to you for your consideration because it's, it's very likely that if you're a born-in witness of a certain age that this book is something that you may never have heard of. But as you can see by the layout of this publication, this publication um, had paragraphs and questions. This book was designed to be considered in a, uh, in a group setting and to be studied. Have you studied it? Do you know anybody who's studied it? Now it's interesting that this publication was never part of the uh, the weekly study arrangement, uh, whether it was at the Kingdom Hall or again as I mentioned in the book study arrangement. I think that personally there are a couple very good reasons why this publication was was never studied. I'm not going to share my personal opinion on that because it's simply speculation. I do not know why this publication was not studied. But think about it from the perspective that we'd mentioned on more than one occasion in this discussion. From the, stat, from the standpoint of intellectual honesty, if a Jehovah's Witness minister is asking a member of the public to examine their religion and to say, are you practicing your religion simply because your parents practice that religion? or your grandparents practice that religion. The concept that was put forth in this book is that it's, it's entirely possible for religious ideas to be implanted in someone. And therefore, a lot of human beings will just simply go along with what is expected of them to do in order to get the approval of their parents, their family, their, their, their social group. And if that's true with other religions, it has to intellectually be true, possibly, with witnesses as well. That somebody who's brought up in an environment of only being surrounded by other members of the Jehovah's Witness faith, that it's possible that the, the tenets of your faith were based on ideas that were, to use the language of this publication, ideas that were implanted in you. So therefore, I am not submitting this video to you with the thought or the suggestion that I, as an individual, have the answers to those questions. I'm not suggesting that you believe anything specifically. What I am simply doing respectfully is asking you to be honest with yourself if you are a born-in witness. Have I done the research about the origins of my faith? And have I done so in resources that are beyond just publications of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society? Have I gone to other faiths? Have I visited or spoken with somebody that has a different faith? So there is a there is an illustration that was used at a district convention that I went to years ago. And I think it's fitting to this situation. So there's an old... Um, there's an old Indian um, story that was made into a poem by a poet in the um, 19th century by the name of John G. 
Sachs, John G. Sachs. That's spelled S-A-X-E. And if you want to take a look at it, it's you can you can YouTube it, you can Google it, you can find it on Wikipedia. John G. Sachs came out with a poem called "The Blind Men and the Elephant," and I think it applies to this conversation. So in this poem, there were six blind men who were encountering an elephant. Now, none of them had ever seen an ele elephant before. And when they first get to the elephant, each one of those blind men reaches out and touches a different part of the elephant. And one blind man who is touching the, the trunk of the elephant declares that based on his experience, I can come to the conclusion that an elephant is very much like a snake because based on his experience of touching the trunk. Another blind man had reached out very close to that first blind man and had encountered the, the tusk of the elephant. And he said, based on my conclusion, my own personal experience, I can say that an elephant is very much like a spear. And the other blind man reached out and touched the leg of the elephant and said that an elephant is very much like a tree. And another one reached out and touched the ear of the elephant and came to the conclusion based on his experience that an elephant, the nature of an elephant is very much like a fan. The other one reached out and touched the side of the elephant and came to the conclusion that based on his experience that an elephant, the nature of which is very much like a building, like a house. And the other one reached out and touched the tail of the elephant and came to the conclusion that an elephant is very much like a, a rope. Now there was another student sitting by uh, the teacher who was the, the teacher of these blind men. And he did not touch the elephant. Nor did he obviously see it because he was blind as well. And the conclusion that he came to is that all of my comrades are describing the same thing, but they're describing it based on their own experience. And I thought it was interesting that in, in the context of this conversation that we're having, I think that that really applies here that the, the human experience is such that there's all, all kinds of different ways to explain um, the nature of God. And somebody trying to suggest to you that somebody else's personal experience with the divine is invalid because it doesn't have the same perspective of their own experience, therefore makes it wrong, is just not intellectually honest. So if you haven't uh, if you're not familiar with the book, Mankind's Search for God, find it. Um, you're not going to find it on the Watchtower online. You're probably going to have to go to your own personal library of your family um, and blow the dust off of it. Uh, perhaps it's available at the Kingdom Hall that you go to. Uh, take a look at it. Read it and follow the directions and the instructions and the example that are given of doing your own research. And if you haven't done so, done so already, please also consider... Um, looking up the story of the, the blind men and the elephant. I think it's a pretty fitting analogy uh, and story that goes along with this topic. So uh, I'd be interested to know what your, um, what your feelings and thoughts are on this. And thank you again so much for sharing your time with me today.